città dove ci sono un po' strumento, nessuno lo nega, possono essere indispensabili, sono i farmaci che come voi sapete stanno la vita, ma la terapia non è solo farmacologica, ci sono molti effetti rilevanti che dipendono dalla relazione tra il medico e il paziente e che possono essere catalizzati e resi possibili come effetti nella terapia di tutti i giorni. Del resto, se negli studi di farmacologia dobbiamo usare il ramo con il placebo per poter valutare l'effetto reale del farmaco e non sovrastimarlo, vuol dire che una parte di terapia c'è nel placebo. Poi, per tradizione, ci dimentichiamo degli effetti del placebo e così buttiamo via il bambino insieme all'acqua del bagno. Ed è ora di cominciare a ripensare queste cose non come terapia finta, ma come terapia vera, perché che la definiamo finta o vera è solo una questione di prospettiva da cui giudichiamo, perché se gli effetti ci sono, gli effetti sono sempre veri, non sono... E eh, quindi questo argomento ha delle implicazioni anche epistemologiche e filosofiche fondamentali, perché tutto quello che non abbiamo fino ad oggi compreso, trascurato, dipende dal paradigma che abbiamo utilizzato, che funziona benissimo, ma è un metodo che non può essere elevato al rango di ontologia pensando che si esista solo quello che è compatibile con quel metodo. Quindi si tratta di aprirci a quello che altrimenti corriamo il rischio di sottostimare per ragioni di eh, assiomi che abbiamo, che abbiamo adottato in maniera un po' a priori. Il professor Kirsch non avrebbe bisogno di presentazioni, io non vi dico tutti i posti, tutti gli insegnamenti che ha avuto fino adesso, se non vi lascio più spazio neanche per fare la lezione, ma attualmente è co-direttore del centro di studi sul placebo della Harvard University Medical School ed è docente in altre quattro università americane, ha pubblicato oltre 300 tra articoli su riviste scientifiche e eh, prosidi di congressi e capitoli di libri, autore di dieci libri, di cui uno magnifico, molto provocatorio ma molto bello, proprio sull'ascesa del mito e il declino degli antidepressivi, che non vuol dire che non funziona, che nessuno lo nega, ma che dobbiamo stare attenti sempre a non sopra o sottostimare rispetto a come le cose sono nella realtà. E a questo punto io lascio la parola al dottor De Carlo, che è il presidente degli ordini dei psicologi, per un saluto ufficiale. Grazie. Buon pomeriggio. È un piacere essere qui a parlare in un contesto tradizionalmente sanitario, con persone tradizionalmente nel paradigma di sanità. Eh, come molti di voi sapranno, direi tutti, la nuova legge 3 del 18, ex IDL Lorenzina, ha transitato completamente la professione psicologica all'interno delle professioni sanitarie, cosa che prima era eh, una situazione un po' di impasse eh, risolta per fortuna. Ora, essere diventati come psicologi in professione sanitaria non significa appiattirsi su un modello eh, medicale di fine ottocento, cosa che la conferenza di oggi ci dimostra non è più neanche quello fondamentale e unico per i medici. Significa costruire un paradigma di sanità centrato sulla persona, un paradigma di sanità che prenda in considerazione tutte le possibili strade per, da una parte, cura, terapia, ma non soltanto anche per la prevenzione e anche finalmente, direi con la legge ex Lorenzin, per l'aumento della salute di chi è già in salute. Il cambiamento della sanità in Italia non può non passare per un cambiamento di mentalità da una parte dei professionisti sanitari tutti, medici, psicologi, infermieri e tutte le professioni, e soprattutto nella diffusione di questi concetti presso i pazienti, presso le persone che devono incontrare la sanità e che devono viverla con fiducia e soprattutto non devono viverla come un qualcosa a cui ci si rivolge esclusivamente quasi in fin di vita o poco ci manca, ma come un compagno quotidiano per la salute, per il benessere, ma anche per poter lavorare meglio, per poter stare meglio in famiglia, per le relazioni, quindi una serie di professionalità utili tutti i giorni. Chiudo con una considerazione che eh, potrebbe essere interessante eh, per quanto riguarda eh, l'argomento di oggi. Quest'anno sono 40 anni, 
40 anni della legge Basaglia, intanto, che è un grande contributo che l'Italia ha dato al pensiero mondiale. Basaglia era un innovatore di livello mondiale, riconosciuto nel mondo, ma, questa è meno nota, sono anche 40 anni della legge Anselmi, con Basaglia, Trieste, Tina Anselmi, Castelfranco Veneto. La legge Anselmi ha trasformato la sanità italiana da un sistema prettamente sanitario a un sistema socio-sanitario e questo ci ha permesso di essere la sanità pubblica migliore al mondo, ce la giochiamo con la Francia, c'è da vedere su quali, eh, su quali indicatori si va a studiare. Ora, pare che la regione, specialmente in Veneto, non abbia più tanto un'idea legata a Tinasemi, ma ad altri modelli. Quando si parla di socio sanitario, dei distretti, delle ARL e delle URS come le abbiamo conosciute, significa che il professionista sanitario è facilmente accessibile, è sul territorio e quindi anche un rapporto come quello di cui sentiremo a parlare oggi è valorizzato. Un sistema che mette soltanto al centro i grandi ospedali perde la capacità di intervenire su base quotidiana in questi termini. Ed è per questo che noi dobbiamo non tanto fare battaglie politiche, che ovviamente quelle le lasciamo ai politici, ma dal punto di vista professionale dare un contributo di contenuti e spiegare perché il professionista sanitario deve essere a contatto con le persone, perché il professionista sanitario deve essere vicino, perché il professionista sanitario deve essere accessibile. Io vi auguro di apprendere molte cose assolutamente interessanti e vi chiedo di portarle nella vostra pratica quotidiana, nella vostra vita professionale e di informare le persone di ciò che siamo, di ciò che facciamo e di ciò che sappiamo fare. Grazie e buon lavoro. Grazie. Eh, devo confessare che parlo un po' di italiano, ma i miei amici italiani mi hanno detto che non devo parlare delle cose serie in italiano perché sembro un po' cretino. <ride> e adesso cambio e parlo in inglese, scusi. Esatto. Uh, I told my son that I was coming here to speak and he said to me, Dad, what kind of talk are you going to give in Padova? And I said, it will be a placebo talk. And he said, well, is it going to be a real placebo talk? Or are you just going to pretend to speak and see if anyone understands and hears you? And I told him it's double blind, so I really don't know if you see it. So we'll see. I want to go back to 1955, when a very important article was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association with the title, The Powerful Placebo. And Henry Beecher, the author, wrote that the placebo effect was powerful. Then in 2001, in the New England Journal of Medicine, an analysis was, meta-analysis was done, and the title of the article reporting it asked the question, is the placebo powerless? And they concluded that they found little evidence that placebos had powerful clinical effects. So the question then is, who is right? Was Beecher right in 1955, or were the Danish uh, researchers, Goethe and, and, and Robertson, right in 2001? And the answer is, both were right, and neither was right. And to explain why, let me start with thinking about the difference between responses and effects. So you give someone a drug, and you have a response. But that's not the effect of the drug, because part of that might be due to the placebo response, placebo effect. 
So in order to know what the real effect of the drug is, we do clinical trials and we compare the response to the placebo to the response to the drug. And the difference between the two is what we consider to be the drug effect, the actual effect of the drug. But then let's look at the placebo response. Is that a placebo effect? Well, not necessarily. Imagine that you have a raffredore, a cold, and, and, and I give you a placebo. And I wait two weeks, and then I see if you've improved. I can do this as a study with many, many people, and almost everybody will improve but they would have improved even if I didn't give them the placebo. So in order to estimate the placebo effect, we have to have a third group, a group that doesn't get the placebo. Because people get better depending on the condition, the natural history of that condition. There's also a, an artifact, a statistical artifact called regression toward the mean. People get better because of that, when you measure them a second time, you have to control for that. And the placebo effect is the difference between what would happen if you didn't give the placebo and you did. Now, back in 1955, when Beecher wrote his article, The Powerful Placebo, he was looking at placebo responses. When Goethe and Robertson did their medicine, uh, meta-analysis, they looked only at studies that also had a natural history control group, a weightless control group, or a no treatment control group, so they could look at the placebo effect, which is always going to be smaller than the placebo response. So, one point for Robertson and Goethe, but it's not the whole story. Here's a study in which they looked at medication and supportive care, and also placebo and supportive care in the treatment of depression. And over a 10-week trial, this is what they found, these are improvements in, the, in, in depression scores. They also included a third group, which got supportive care only. And here was the uh, changes in depression effectiveness. And so what you'll see is, although you have very little difference between drug and placebo, you've got a big difference between placebo and just supportive care alone. So that demonstrates a real placebo effect, and it's a bigger effect, you see, than the drug effect in this case, much bigger. But that's still not the whole story. And to tell more of the story, I want to introduce you to what Harald Wallach has called the efficacy paradox. Paradoso, the efficacy. Did I say that right? It's more or less. No, man. We're going to look at it first in depression, then we're going to look at it in migraine. First in depression. If you look at all the studies that have been done, on acupuncture versus placebo, in the treatment of depression, you get no difference. No difference. If you look at the, all the studies that have been done comparing SSRI, antidepressant, to placebo, you get a real difference, a statistically significant difference. It's not a big, big one, but it is a, a, a difference. So this tells us that Antidepressant drugs, SSRIs, are better than acupuncture, right? But what about if we look at clinical trials that directly compare acupuncture to SSRIs in the treatment of depression? They're the same. How can that be? That's a paradox. If we look at the first two bars, we see that <coughs> SSRI is better than acupuncture. If we look at the last, we see that they, they are exactly the same. Before explaining the paradox, let's look at another example of it. <coughs> this is the treatment of migraine. 
Here are differences in response rates, and this is the difference between the effect of medication and the effect of placebo. And you see, you get a difference. Again, not a very large one, but you get a difference. Now we look at acupuncture versus placebo, and you get a smaller difference. So, active medication is better than active acupuncture. Clear, right? But wait a second, what if these are response rates differences, medication versus placebo, acupuncture versus placebo. What if we just look at the responses to medication and the responses to acupuncture? That is, without looking at the control groups, how much improvement do you see in those given medication? How much improvement do you see in those given acupuncture? And you see there's more improvement in those given acupuncture than in those given medication. So acupuncture is better than antidepressants. But wait a second. Antidepressants are better than acupuncture. No, acupuncture is better than antidepressants. How can you explain that? How can we understand that? And the trick is, the secret is, to look at both the response to the real medication and the response to the placebo. Here's the response to placebo medication, and here's the response to placebo acupuncture. And what you'll see is that placebo acupuncture is better than placebo medication. As a result, the difference between med medication and, and, and placebo is larger than the difference between real and sham acupuncture. Sham acupuncture is placebo acupuncture. Here's the trick. Different placebos produce different results. Somehow we in a way know that, otherwise when we did a clinical trial we wouldn't insist that the placebo be the same color and the same shape. We always do, right? But we forget that. And we think, oh, there's just the placebo effect. There is not one placebo effect. There are many different placebo effects. The key to the problem with the Goethe and Robertson meta-analysis, the newer meta-analysis, is uh, revealed in one word. It's the one I highlighted here, the word the. The placebo effect. Singular. The fetto placebo. See? They looked at many different diseases. They looked at many different types of placebos. And they concluded there was little effect of the placebo. They looked at just what they called placebos, included taking pills, getting relaxation training. Just reading, telling a person, read some nice fiction books. Or having conversations with the patient about hobbies, newspapers, magazines, food. They call those placebos. And they looked, compared them, looked at the placebo effect from the treatment of infertility and oral hygiene and the common cold and menopause and marital discord. So now here's the question. What if you took the same data, the same conditions, and you tried to evaluate the effect of medicine, of medication, of treatments, of the bona fide, the real treatments, through the same diseases, with different kinds of placebos? What would you find? What would our conclusions be? Well, this has now been done. Jeremy Horwick at Oxford University took the data that Robertson and Goethe had used in their meta-analysis, they reanalyzed it, but instead of looking at just the effect of the placebo compared to no treatment, which is what Goethe, they also looked at what's the effect of the bona fide treatment compared to placebo, what is the treatment effect. So now we're going to look at the placebo effect, the response to placebo, minus the response to uh, no treatment. Here it is. That's with the small effect that they said, is it powerless? And here's the treatment effect. Treatment versus placebo. 
about the same, in fact, not significantly different. So, does that mean that medicine is powerless? No, of course not. Medicine has many wonderful effects. Conventional medicine, pills have wonderful, there are many pills that have wonderful effects. But the medical treatment effect depends on the condition being treated, first of all. Antibiotics work for bacterial infections, but they do not work for viral infections. And it depends on the nature of the treatment. Antibiotics work, but bloodletting does not. Bloodletting, you know, the old treatment with leeches on, draw out the blood, the bad blood. The same is true with placebo. The placebo effect depends on the condition being treated and the nature of the placebo. With the condition being treated, here are some examples. The treatment of infertility, there's no placebo effect at all. There, there, people are going to, there are studies looking for the placebo effect as a, as a treatment, placebo as a treatment for infertility. No effect. Pain, about half of the response to pain medication is a placebo effect. The other half is a real medication effect. With Parkinson's disease, about the same. Big placebo effect, irritable bowel syndrome. An even larger portion of the effect is due to the placebo effect. Anxiety, depression. And these might be underestimates. The real effects might look something like this. Why? Why? Imagine. Imagine that you are a patient and have been recruited for a clinical trial, a randomized clinical trial. You have to give informed consent. And as part of the informed consent procedure, you are told that this is a clinical trial. You may be getting the real drug. You may be getting a placebo. And you're also told that it's a double blind. That's not what double blind means. <laughs> that you won't know until the end of the study whether you, what, what you've got. That's double blind. So you're told that. And you're told that the therapy, with antidepressant trials, you're told the therapeutic effects might take some weeks before you experience them. Uh, you're also told that there are side effects. They don't take weeks. And you're told what the side effects are. So you may have dry mouth, nausea, insomnia, sexual dysfunction, other... Now, if I were a subject in one of these studies, and I bet this is true for most of you as well, I'd be wondering, which group am I in? What did I get? Have I taken a real drug? Have I taken a placebo? I don't know. It's a double-blind trial. They won't tell me until later. Huh. All right, well, my mouth is getting dry. I'm thirsty. Thank you, placebo. Oh, my mouth is getting dry. That's one of the side effects that they said I might get from this drug. That means I'm in the real drug condition. Hooray, I'm in the drug group. I feel better already. So part of the effect of, that you get is the difference between drug and placebo with drugs that have side effects that are very noticeable may not be a true drug effect. Part of it may be an enhanced placebo effect. An enhanced placebo effect that is stronger because the person has figured out that they are in the drug group. So now they are expecting more certain that they're going to get change, that they're going to get improvement, and so they get it. And there are studies, I don't think I've put this on a slide, but there are studies that compare Response to a drug in trials that don't have placebos, in open label trials, to 
response to the same drug in placebo-controlled trials, where people know they might get a placebo. And with drug after drug, the response when you have an open-label trial without a placebo control, the person knows they're getting, it's a new drug, but it's still, it's a real, the real drug is better than the response to the exact same drug when the people know they might be getting a placebo. Doctors and patients break blind. That is, they figure out what group they are in, especially if they're in the drug groups. This is just one example of that. This was a clinical trial of placebo, alprazolam, and amipamine. And we're looking at, and they asked patients in this trial, they rarely do this. They should do this in every clinical trial. It should be routine. It would not add anything to the cost of the trial, but it would provide useful information. They asked both the patients and the doctors to guess what they had been given. Have you been given placebo or have you been given the real drug? Has your patient been given placebo or has the patient been given real drug? This was one trial where they did that. Since there were three drugs, you would figure by chance they would be right one-third of the time and wrong two-thirds of the time, if they were just guessing. Yes? So that's the benchmark. Here's what happens. Your patients in each of the three groups, so especially in the imidacloprene group, which is a tricyclic antidepressant, you get 70% of them saying, oh, oh, you've given me the imidacloprene. They've been told what the side effects of imidacloprene are. Doctors do even better than patients in figuring out not only that the person is not getting a placebo, but the active drug, but which active drug there again. Does that have an effect on the outcome? Now again, we're going to look at patients, and then we're going to look at the people who have done the ratings. Sometimes it's a doctor, sometimes it's a different doctor, so they can be double blind. Doing the, who's doing uh, uh, the ratings? And we're going to look at the relationship between being correct, being accurate, and guessing what you've gotten. And what's the difference in that study between the drug and placebo? What's the effect size? And here what you see is that the greater the accuracy with which the patients figure out, guess, not really guessing, is it, um, which group they are in, the greater the difference between drug and placebo. And you find the same thing when you look at the doctors doing the, the ratings. So that's the condition being treated. The nature of the placebo also makes a difference in how strong the placebo effect is. So for example, it depends on what color the placebo is. Blue placebos are better than red and orange pills in producing sedative effects. Red pills, however, are better in producing stimulant effects. And they're also better than both white, green, blue, and green pills. Red is better as in reducing pain. The dose of the placebo makes a difference. Two placebo pills produce a better response than one placebo pill. Four placebo pills produce a better response than two placebo pills. The more of them you take, the better the response. When we do our studies with placebos now, we say, okay, two pills twice a day. So it's four pills a day. The strength of the drug that the placebo is pretending to be makes a difference. Placebo morphine is more effective than placebo aspirin. <laughs> They're both, placebo morphine is about half as effective as real morphine. Placebo aspirin is about half as effective as real aspirin. Placebos with a recognizable brand name are more effective 
than generic. We'll see most of it. The pharmaceutical companies make a lot of money on this because us can make that drug. The patent is only good for a certain amount of time. It goes off patent. Now other companies can produce the identical, chemically identical, same drug as a generic drug, sell it for a lot less, but the company that manufactures the brand name still puts the brand name drug on the market because people say, oh, Bayer, that's a good one. That's one of the, I don't know what about this other thing, but so people buy it and probably have better effects. Well, you know they do because there's been a study comparing a brand name placebo to a generic placebo, and the brand name placebo was significantly better than the generic placebo. The price makes a difference. An expensive placebo is better, has better effects than a cheap placebo. And the mode of administration. So placebo capsules give better results than placebo pills. Placebo injections are better than placebo capsules. Intravenous placebos are more effective than single injections. And surgery, that's the most powerful placebo at all, of all. And of course, there have been trials with placebo surgery. The first one was done in 1959. Back in 1959, there was a procedure that was used in the treatment of angina, heart pain. That was called mammary ligation. It was actually invented here in the valley. It involves tying off the, 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 the uh, mammary artery to change the flow of blood to the heart. And this would, it was a good theory. And people claimed in those days that there was an 80, approximately 80% 80 success rate with this surgical procedure. In 1959, there were two groups, research groups, same time, seemingly, I think independently, came up with the same idea. Let's see if there's a placebo effect, and that's being part of it. So they did what is called placebo surgery, Sam's sham surgery. After the patients were given the real surgery, and the other half of the patients, they opened the patient up, they made some noises, spent some time, closed the patient, filled him up again, didn't do the surgical intervention, didn't do, didn't do the memory ligation. What did they get? With the real surgery, they found 73% improvement. With the sham surgery, they found 83% improvement. <laughs> now, don't take this as meaning that the sham surgery was better because the difference between the two were, were, was not statistically significant. So, but certainly the sham surgery was no worse than the real surgery, and that surgery is not done anymore. They stopped doing it. Here's another surgical procedure. Arthroscopic knee surgery for osteoarthritis. They open up the knee, they clean it, they scrape it, they closed the knee up again. Group that was doing this surgery in Texas did a clinical trial. After people, they opened up, they did this procedure, they closed them up again. The other half, they opened them up, they didn't do the procedure. They closed them up again, sham surgery. What did they get? Two weeks after the surgery, People in the placebo group were doing significantly better than patients in the real surgery group at walking and climbing stairs. Those were the only differences. They favored the placebo, the sham surgery. The explanation was, well, the patients in the sham surgery group were spared. They did not have to have the surgical trauma, the trauma of the surgery. They were just over there and Good thing I put the top back on. One year later, people in the placebo surgery group were still doing significantly better than those in the real surgery group at walking and climbing stairs. And two years later, there was no difference between the groups. 
Don't let anyone tell you that the placebo effect is short-lived. We don't know about the two-year, but at one year, there's already a difference favoring the placebo group compared to real surgery. Imagine compared to no treatment. You would think this was 2002, that's 16 years ago, right? This is 2018, I think, yeah. Uh, you would think they would have stopped doing arthroscopic surgery. Here's the rate of surgical procedures for arthroscopic surgery in England, Scotland, Denmark, and Austria. You see, 2002 on the left, that's when the study was published. There have been two applications since that everyone finds the same results. What happens in terms of doing the procedure? It continues to increase. People do it more and more, despite these data. The British Medical Journal last year published this graph. That's where I got this from. And commented, knee arthroscopy is the most common orthopedic procedure in countries with available data. And they issued a clinical practice guideline, and their conclusion was, we make a strong recommendation against the use of arthroscopy in nearly all patients with degenerative knee disease. That's pretty strong. We'll see if that makes a difference in what happens next. That was just last year. We don't have any new data on it. Surgery is more effective, even if it's sham surgery, than, than pills. Here are response rates to placebo pills versus placebo surgery for the treatment of migraine. That's the effect of the response rate to placebo pills. Here's the response to placebo. Surgery. She has surgery. It's a big difference, isn't it? Parkinson's disease. Response to placebo pills. Response to placebo surgery. It's become notorious in the investigations and in treatments for Parkinson's disease. They call it sometimes the sham wall, the mur of the feet of procedure. Uh, do open-label trials without any placebo controls. These are four different surgical procedures that have been tried with, with uh, Parkinson's disease. You get improvement for one year, for the second one for four years, one year, one year. And then they did phase two trials, trials controlled with placebo controls. And what did they find? No difference. First one, they find a difference between, between real and sham surgery. The other three procedures, no difference between the two. So the response to placebo can be long-lasting. Here's another example of it. It's a study that was published in 2011 on the effect of a treatment called saw palmetto extract on symptoms of the lower urinary tract. Here is the changes over time, 72 weeks on the real uh, treatment. Here's the response to placebo over that same length of time. And there's study after study showing comparable curves, no matter how short or how long the treatment, there may be a difference, and there may be a big difference even between drug and placebo, where you get a placebo effect, the time course seems to mimic that of the real drug effect. And occasionally, occasional studies, like the arthroscopic knee surgery studies, show some benef benefit for the sham group, for the placebo group, that's greater than the benefit of the real treatment group. Uh, here's another one with the uh, osteoarthritis, pain, uh, reduction, but not with surgery, with the uh, pill, and with the placebo. This does not happen very often. And since, if there were no difference, you would expect it to happen about one in 20 times, because that's where we set our conventional cutoff for statistical significance, 
when you do get it, that's probably, unless you can replicate it, that's probably just a, a chance finding. What does happen? So, placebos can be powerful for certain conditions. They can be long-lasting. They don't have side effects, especially if you tell people that this doesn't have a side effect. You tell them it has a side effect, then you can produce, sometimes you produce these nocebo effects. Nocebo, placebo, placebo, in Latin, I shall please, nocebo, I shall harm, uh, and, and it's the, the no, nocebo effect. Effect on nocebo, as they say sometimes, it's the placebo's evil twin. Gemello, the cattivo, the placebo. Well, so should we prescribe that? Well, there's a problem. As this patient says to the doctor, but if I know it's a placebo, will it still work? And conventional wisdom tells us no, it won't. I mean, after all, can you imagine telling a patient, take this placebo twice a day, and if it doesn't work, I'll give you a spawn. You wouldn't do that, right? We did that. We did that first in the study of what we call open-label placebo for irritable bowel syndrome. And open-label in this case means we told people that we're giving them a placebo. We recruited patients with an advertisement for a novel mind-body management study of irritable bowel syndrome. Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, which is one of the hospitals in the Harvard Med School. And there was a phone number that they could call if they were interested in participating. And when they called, they were told on the phone that this study involves, the treatment involves using placebo pills, which are like sugar pills. They don't have any active ingredients, but they've been shown to have self-healing properties, whatever that means. And then the patients met, came, would, they agreed to study, they signed the informed consent, and they meet with the physician, and the physician says, tells them, well, first of all, one thing we know is that there's a powerful placebo effect in the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. And what appears to happen is that the body learns to respond to the pills, the needles, the things that contain the medication they are getting, just like Pavlov's dog learned to respond to the sound of a bell by salivating after it had been associated with food. So you had your whole life in which you've been given different kinds of effective treatments, and you've learned to associate the effect of the treatment with the pill, the injection. Positive attitude. We told the patients that that helps, but it's not critical. The important thing is to take the pills faithfully as directed. And then they were divided into two groups. And those in the open label placebo group are given a little pill box with pills in it and a label on it that says placebos. Placebo. And it says under that no active ingredient. Always I'll take two of these pills twice a day. And the other group, I already know treatment control group, so that we can see if there's not just a placebo response, but a placebo effect. Here's what we get. Response rates in those in the control group versus those in the open label placebo group, placebo without deception and symptom severity, yeah. same two groups, same effect. What you're going to see next is an interview with, see and hear, an interview with two of the patients in this study. The first one you'll actually see the patient from uh, a television news report. The second one is from a radio interview and report and so all of a sudden the picture will stop, but you'll still hear sound, and that's the interview with, with the second patient. Diane Sanborn, a nurse practitioner for her entire career, 
knows all about the placebo effect. Still, she was surprised how much it helped her in this latest study. This was like a miracle to me. Researchers recruited 80 people, including Sandra, suffering from irritable bowel syndrome, a condition affecting 10 to 15 percent of the population, mostly women. For 16 years, irritable bowel syndrome has made Linda Bonanno's life miserable. So when she saw a TV ad about a study of IBS, she called right out to volunteer. But when they told her what the study was about, she thought they were kidding. I didn't really think it would work. The researchers told her if she signed up, Bonanno would be assigned to no treatment at all, or she'd be given placebo pills. And she'd be told up front they were fake pills with no real medicine in them. Call it an honest placebo. I said, how in the world does that going to work? But they said, well, it's fine, it doesn't matter. I said, all right, let me see how great my mind is. Banana was one of the volunteers whose cramps, bloating, and diarrhea magically went away while she was taking two placebos twice a day. I was shocked that at the end of the week when I went back to his office, I said, can I have more of these? I know I shouldn't have them, but something's working. Why did you start laughing? So I hope you can follow that. At the end of the study, she comes back to the physician, prescribing the physician, says, I know they are just sugar pills, but I can think Something worked. Can I have more of them? <laughs> Diane Sandler, a nurse practitioner. Diane! Diane said. Diane! Okay. For some reason, it didn't want to go forward. But So the question now is, should we prescribe placebos openly? Well, there's a problem that you don't have with that, but that we have. We are one of the few industrialized countries, we meaning the United States, the Americans, the American, the, 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 one of the few countries in the world um, in which we don't have any national health program. And so the question I think might happen is the patient would say to the doctor, the, the nurse says to the doctor, he wants to know if, 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 if you're going to give them placebos, can she play with pay you with fake money? <laughs> placebo money. Fortunately, fortunately, we can get placebo effects even without placebos. What do I mean by that? Let's imagine that these, remember these three components of the drug response. Natural history, what would happen if you didn't do anything? the placebo effect and the drug effect. Let's assume that these are additive. Later I'll show you some evidence of whether they are or not. Right now let's test it as a hypothesis. Let's hypothesize that they are additive. So here's what would happen if you didn't do anything at all. You give someone a placebo, you add to that the placebo effect, and this is the response you get. And you add to that the drug effect, the difference between drug and placebo, that's the drug effect, and now you've got the total response. If they are additive, and you increase any one of them, any one of the three components, the total response is going to increase. So, you've increased the placebo effect, now you've increased the response to treatment effect. Can they be additive? Are they additive? The lovely study that we were talking about earlier that was done by Fabrizio Benedetti in Torino. Uh, he's one of the world's top placebo researchers. Well, he's a real researcher, but he does research on the placebo effect. Uh, and he, what, this is a lovely design. Got patients who are, have just gone through a surgical procedure, post-operative patients. And they are hooked up to a um, IV, an intravenous, and they start saline. And they're told at some point we're going to start the morphine drip. And this is part of the informed consent. We may tell you when we start it, or we may not tell you when we start it. And this is what you'd like to, we'd like to agree to, is to whether that you may or may not be informed when we start the morphine drip. And patients. Okay, and now we're going to look at hidden open morphine, where you're told now we're starting the drip, versus hidden morphine, where you start the morphine without telling the patient you're starting it. At 30 minutes, 
and 60 minutes after the surgery. This is pain reduction, post-surgical pain reduction with open morphine, and here it is with hidden morphine. About half of the effect of the morphine was a placebo effect. The other half was a real morphine effect. So this, these are placebo effects because they are effects not due to the morphine, but due to the knowledge you're getting morphine, to your beliefs, your expectations, your thoughts, your knowledge. But there are no placebos in this study. It's a placebo effect without placebos. Here's my favorite study of that. It's done by Ulrich of Bingel. In, uh, she was in Essen at that time in Germany. And she used uh, healthy volunteers and a pain stimulus that you can control the intensity of the pain. And uh, they were hooked up to an IV. And they were given Remifentanil. Remifentanil is an opiate that's considered to be between 100 and 200 times more and stronger, more effective, than, uh, more powerful than morphine. Here's pain ratings at baseline before doing anything. Then they started the remifentanil, but they told, did not tell the patient. It was a hidden infusion at this point, very much like in the Vendetti study. And here's the pain reduction. Here's you see the pain reduction, pure drug effect. Pain before you start the, start the remifentanil, pain after you start the remifentanil, but without the person's knowledge. So it's, they have, there's no placebo in here. They don't know that it's started yet. Then you tell them, now we're going to start the remifentanil. Well, it's already been started, but they don't know that. So you tell them, now we're starting it, but nothing new is being done as far as what's going into their veins. And there's a level of pain they report after you tell them they're getting ready fentanyl. And then she told the patients, the, the, the subjects rather, participants, now we're stopping the morphine or the remedy fentanyl. Now we're stopping it. But in fact, they didn't stop it. So they're still getting remedy fentanyl, but now they're told they're not. And here's what happens. The pain goes right back up again. There you see the placebo effect without placebo. There you see the nocebo effect of being told that uh, you know when you're getting the drug. So, how can we boost the placebo component of treatment? If the treatment has a placebo component, component of the overall response that's due to the placebo effect, we want to increase that so that we can boost the response to medication generally. How can we do it? Well, here are two ways to do it, and then I'm going to talk about a third. The two ways are, one, enhance, improve the relationship between the doctor and the patient. If the doctor and the patient have a better relationship, then they have a better, the patient might have a better response to treatment. And the second way is increasing expectancy. convey information that leads the patient to expect the patient to the treatment to be more effective. Within limits, you, want, you don't want to create unrealistic expectations. You want to create positive but realistic expectations. How can you do that? We studied that. We studied that in an earlier study, actually, of irritable bowel syndrome. It's the first study that our group did on IBS and irritable bowel st uh, syndrome, and we have three groups. One group is a wait list. Well, right now you can understand why we need to have a wait list arm in order because we want to investigate the placebo effect. Second group was given placebo acupuncture, sham acupuncture, following a initial intake interview with the clinician that lasted for 10 minutes, a clinician that was not paying a whole lot of attention. Here she is doing things on the computer while interviewing the patient, not making any real acting. You know, a researcher, matter of fact, not unpleasant, but neutral. And uh, then we had another group 
which we call the augmented placebo. It's the exact same placebo acupuncture. I don't know if you know placebo acupuncture. We have these needles called Stryberger needles, named after this fellow named Stryberger who invented them. And uh, what happens, you know how you have daggers that you can use in stage plays? You stab the person and the blade goes back into the shaft. So this is a needle, you put it on, and the needle, you can feel it, and it pinches a little, but it doesn't penetrate the skin. It goes back into the handle of the, of, of the needle. And, uh, and we also put it in the wrong places, according to the acupuncture theory. This time, though, for this group, there was a 45-minute initial session with a clinician who was warm and empathic and paid attention to the patient and looked the patient in the face and was not distracted doing this on a computer all the time and also expressed confidence in the effectiveness of this treatment for this particular patient after having this nice long interview. Here's what we got at three weeks. We get some improvement just through natural history. Maybe it's regression to the mean or some combination of that. We get significantly more improvement when they're given the placebo and even more improvement if the placebo is given in the context of a warm therapeutic relationship. That's at three weeks, they're the same results at six weeks. You see it holds on through the therapeutic relationship and the person's expectancies and beliefs can make a tremendous difference. And one of the things that I would love to see happen, and I think for the benefit of patients, uh, would be that in medical schools, as part of the training, Physicians that ought to be trained in how to form a good therapeutic relationship. Some doctors just do it naturally and don't need any real training. Some don't at all. You've probably experienced in your life doctors who seem to relate to you and wind up having more confidence in them than other doctors who don't. I think this should be a part of medical training. It not cost money. It costs a little more in time, but it might actually save the health system money if the outcomes are better. Clinicians can make a difference with real medication as well as placebo. But you would expect if the two effects are additive. Here's an example of this, and this is a study uh, that comes out of Bruce Wampold's lab. K, I think at that time was one of Bruce's uh, uh, graduate students. And this was a study of a tricyclic antidepressant, imipramine, and compared to placebo, it's an RCT, a randomized clinical trial. And there were nine physicians who were treating patients double blind. So each physician gave some patients the real drug and gave other, and gave other patients a placebo. And we're going to look at change scores uh, on, on in depression, both on the real drug and on the placebo, as a function of who the physician is. And what you'll see right away is that those physicians who do better with placebo also do better with the real drug. This line here, this is what would be the average outcome across all nine physicians. Going down, you've got better outcomes. Going up, you've got worse outcomes. Not meaning that the person's gotten worse, but could be gotten worse or not as, gotten as better. What you see is that what I'll call for a minute the good doctors those that get good results get better results on placebo than the poor doctors do with the active medication. There was more greater difference, substantially greater difference as a function of who the doctor was than there was as a function of whether it was real medication or placebo. That won't always be true. That depends also on the strength of the real medication compared to the placebo. 
with this it certainly is true, and it does show at least proof of concept that with some drugs, it can make be more important how we relate to the patient than what the drug is. So those are third way of boosting, increasing the placebo effect in treatment. And that is, add an open label, honest placebo to the existing treatment. You do it, you still get the regular treatment, but in addition, you say, why don't you take another thing too, and you tell them what it is, and you explain it, just as we did in the IBS study. And we've done this in a study done in Portugal on chronic low back pain. Chronic low back pain. Same meeting with the physician, same story given to them. They are randomized. Half of them are randomized to continue their treatment because they have been getting treatment as usual. The other half continue the treatment they've been getting and in addition are asked to take two placebo pills twice a day. They're given pills labeled placebo. 80% of, 87%, almost 9 out of 10 of, of these patients were taking pain medications, mostly non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And they were told you can keep taking your medication, but in addition to taking the medication, we'd also like you to take these placebo pills with the explanation that we gave. Here's what we got. Open placebo added to an existing treatment, pain reduction, usual treatment, pain reduction, no change in the body, no added placebo. After three weeks, we told the people in the usual treatment group, the ones who are only getting the actual medication, we're not taking an additional, additional four pills a day, we told them, okay, now for the next three weeks, if you like, we will give you the placebo. We give them the placebo. Here's what happens in terms of additional pain reduction after the open label placebo. There we have it again. That effect, by the way, that difference is about what you get between placebo, double blind placebo, and um, double-blind uh, actual medication, NSAIDs, for lower back pain. So we've doubled the pain reduction that they've already experienced through the ongoing treatment. Also measured disability, pain-related disability, open-label placebo, usual treatment. In the usual treatment group, we then say, okay, now you can have the placebo, and they're just improvement in disability. It's going to be an interview, brief clip, with uh, two of the patients in this study. You'll see them both. This was done in Lisbon, the study, so they're speaking Portuguese, and I have subtitles, but the subtitles are in English. <laughs> so hopefully between the Portuguese, which is a Latin language after all, and the subtitles, So, maybe we can prescribe placebos after all. And I have to say that I wish we could prescribe placebos. I'd love to see, I, I love placebos. I love the placebo effect. I've been studying the placebo effect for my entire, acad entire academic career. And at my age, let me tell you, that it's been a lot. You might say that I'm addicted to placebo research. I tried to kick the habit. I tried to stop. I even went to Placebos Anonymous. 
<laughs> where uh, the first step was to admit that I don't really have a problem at all. <laughs> but it didn't work. I could not stop doing placebo research. And I started to wonder, gee, had I had fans, started having this fantasy. I was living in, in England at the time, in the UK, and I uh, had this fantasy that I would wake up one morning and I'd open my favorite morning newspaper. That's a typographical error. It should say the independent, not the dependent. But I would open it up and I would read, to my amazement and delight, that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, has approved placebo in doses ranging from 1 to 40,000 milligrams. And we're getting close. We're getting close because we are doing a new study on irritable bowel syndrome in which we're comparing open-label placebo to double-blind placebo. Our hypothesis is that open-label placebo will be even more effective than double-blind placebo because of the rationale that we use and the explanation that we give to patients. We'll see. We're running the study right now. It's being supported by the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. And because of that, they said that in order to do this study, we had to get approval of the placebo as a new investigative drug. So we applied for approval of the placebo as an investigative drug, and we were granted it by crystalline cellulose. So maybe we can get approval for it, and, and, but, and then, then here's something we could do in the U.S., and they can do this in New Zealand, but you can't do it here. New Zealand and the United States are the only two countries in the world that allow advertising directly consumed to consumers of prescription medications. And you have these ads that you see on television. You remember one of them? There's this young woman who is skipping like this through a field of, of flowers and the voice says, I used to be depressed, but now, and then they list all the side effects very quickly. And then I check with the doctor and we can also do some things with them. Can't do that in Europe, can't do that in other places. One of the results of that is that the placebo response has been increasing ever since in the U.S., ever since they uh, uh, started allowing the advertising, but not in Europe. So I figure, okay, in the U.S. we can advertise placebos now if we can prescribe it, and I start wondering, what would a placebo advertisement look like? And I imagine it might look something like this. Prevaricate. I will translate that for you. It might translate to something like, eh? Inganaria. Inganaria. Does that work? Inganaria. A genuine placebo medication. Tested in more clinical trials than any other treatment. So powerful it's the standard by which all other medications are tested. So effective it can be used, it's used in the treatment of thousands of ailments, and it's safe enough to be given to infants, the elderly, and pregnant women. Remember, if it's a placebo, you can believe in it. That's it.